All right. Oh, I'm so, so glad to be with you guys this morning, and uh, we are going to continue in this awesome series on the glory of God. We've been going through many different aspects of the glory of God, and um, and a lot of times when we talk about the glory of God, it's it's really can get it very mystical. You know, people, including myself, you might dance around these terms and. And if someone were to come up to you and ask you what the glory of God is, it would maybe be hard for you to kind of compose a sentence that really identified the glory of God because it can be so many different things. And so um, I I really want to just continue to review and walk through a few of these things. Um, The glory of God, as we know in the Old Testament, is the word kavod. And, uh, and that is uh, really a literal weightiness or heaviness, but it's used figuratively to denote greatness, honor, splendor, power, wealth, authority, magnificent, magnificence, fame, dignity, and majesty belonging to God. So this is, this is the Old Testament. When we read the version of, when we read about glory in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this is literally what it's applying uh, the word as. And so we know that that's what glory means in the Old Testament. And then continued in the New Testament is the Greek translation. Now, um, the literary common language of the day that the New Testament was written was actually in Greek. And so uh, they also use the word glory, but it's uh, a Greek word called doxa uh, or doxa. Again, I don't speak Greek. It's all Greek to me. Um, but... Uh, it comes to signify uh, a good opinion uh, concerning one resulting in praise, honor, and glory. Again, you'll see it's brightness, radiance, majesty associated with God's presence. And so ultimately, in the Old Testament and then the New Testament, and continuing in the New Testament, the glory of God is uh, the presence of God, as we see in the Old Testament in the, the last definition in Kings, uh, the, in 1 Kings 8.11, uh, where the glory of God fills Solomon's temple. This is the dedicated temple to God. Um, and so the glory of God is the presence of God and all his attributes. Now, uh, there's multiple uh, concepts of the glory of God, multiple topics we can talk about. We've gone through some of these. His divine majesty and presence, worship and honor, revelation and manifestation, moral and spiritual transformation, and the eschatological hope. Now, that's just a long, fancy theological word that means the uh, study of the end times or the uh, theology of the end times. And what we're talking about is basically the the, the promised hope we have in Jesus Christ in, in, in the end of all things. And so uh, those are the different concepts that we can talk about in the glory of God. Um, when we did our first sermon on the series, we talked about imago Dei, which is the Latin word for image of God. And this is what gives us our intrinsic worth, that we are all made in God's image. Every one of us, everyone who's not here, all humanity is made in God's image. And that's where we started with God's glory, because he was glorifying himself in us and through us. Uh, And then we talked about the friend of God and the glory of God and how there's so much correlation and I would say even causation between people throughout the Bible who were considered friends of God and the glory of God that was revealed to them. When you look at Enoch, when you look at Moses, when you look at uh, Isaiah or uh, Abraham, they were all known as friends of God and they were all expressed and shared his glory. Wonderful. Moses says, Lord, I want to see your glory. And God had his glory pass before Moses. Um, Enoch walked with God so much that God just took him, just assumed him into heaven. And uh, I don't know, how, you know, all the theology behind it, but he's God. He can do it. And uh, and and so these, these are uh, things that topics we talked about. We also talked about the glory of God and the salt and light of the earth that we are for God, that we would reveal his glory. And in that, we talked about the definition of the glory of God, which is this. The glory of God refers to the infinite beauty, majesty, and holiness of God manifested in his creation, his acts, and his presence. It is both a reflection of his character and the visible manifestation of of his divine nature and attributes, inviting worship and awe from believers. If we could put everything that we said and fit it into a definition, this is what I believe a good definition of the glory of God. But also, it's not just a noun, it's a verb. 
To glory in God or to glorify God is to reveal his glory to others. And I uh, have this definition for us. To acknowledge his worth when you glorify God. You're acknowledging his worth and beauty, honor his character, and make his greatness known to others. This is what it means to glorify God. And I, and, I, and I just trying to put some tangible ideas and words around it so that when you talk about God's glory or his, his attributes of, uh, uh, to be in his glory or for his glory to fill this auditorium or his glory to fill your home, what does that mean? Well, it means he and his presence are there. So this morning, I want to talk about the glory of God and transformation. Spiritual transformation happens through encountering the divine or a God encounter. What are you talking about, Paul? Well, again, I don't want to be really mysterious. I want to try to make this plain and simple. Uh, I'm going to use the text that the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says this, and we all who with unveiled faces, now because we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. We get to boldly come into the throne room of God. We, 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 our sin is cast into the depths of the sea. God has forgiven every sin against us. And now we can boldly come before him. So it says, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory. Are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It's a beautiful verse. You know, what, why, why would the Apostle Paul talk about staring at the Lord's glory, being in the Lord's glory? It's because when we are in the Lord's glory, it transforms us. It's impossible to be in the presence of God and encountering the living God and seeing his goodness, his kindness, his patience, everything that is amazing about him. Like the song said, there is no end to him. I mean, uh, theologians talk about how that God is so, there is no end to God. And so, you know, the angels in heaven are constantly worshiping him. It's like every time he shows a side of himself, it's a new side. And they, they sing hallelujah, glory to the Lord because of how infinite he is and how all, uh, more than all consuming he is. And so it's impossible to be in his presence, in his glory and see all his goodness and then go outside of it and be an angry grump. That's the, that's a dichotomy. They, that doesn't go hand in hand. Do you see the more you spend time in his glory, the more you get transformed by his glory to reveal his glory. I've said this before, but remember, guys, you are as close to God as you want to be. We are as close to God as we want to be. The person who's in the way is us. When, when, I, when I counsel with people and, and, and they're sharing some of the difficulties of their circumstances or their own shortcomings, I will always ask them this question. So get ready, you know, maybe spend more time with them before you come see me. But I'll ask, how often are you spending time in his presence? I'm not here to condemn you. I just want to know. Most of the answers is that it's minimal. Spending time in his presence is so important because you start to become what you gaze at. You start to transform at what you gaze at. When you look at something enough, you become like it or them. You know, there's that old saying, show me your friends and I'll, sh I'll tell you who you are. This is because it's a, it's a common thing. It's a part of humanity. We, we conform to things and those around us. And so if we're constantly around people who behave in a certain way, we will start to behave in that manner. Not because we're consciously doing it. It's a subconscious act. Sometimes for the good and better. Sometimes for the worst, right? And so I, I was thinking about this and I thought, you know what's really funny? And, and I didn't look this up or anything. It just came to my mind. But... I was just like, this, is, this happens uh, on a practical level all the time in fashion. It does. You, you start uh, seeing something, and you might at first, because it's so trendy, you're like, that is ridiculous. 
I remember when skinny jeans came out and I was younger. I mean, and I was on a college campus and I saw these young kids. I'm like, that is, these boys wearing these skinny jeans. This is ridiculous. Five years later, I'm wearing skinny jeans. Now I'm deleting those photos. But it's funny how fashion starts to assimilate and then everyone starts looking safe. So I, I just had this fun thing and I thought it'd be fun to go through. I like to have, I don't like super heavy sermons the whole time. So anyway, the 1900s, between 1900 and 1910, this is what people dress like. You know what happens is that usually a popular person, designers, they come out with something, someone adapts to it and then other people see it and then they adapt to it and then before you know it, that whole culture will wear the same thing. 1920s changed a little bit more. Kind of fun to look at, right? Kind of cool. 1940s, okay? Some of these things, I'm like, man, these are kind of cool. Like, like if someone came in wearing these suits, I'd be like, they're sharp. I know that it's not fashion today, but it's sharp. Okay. That's the 1940s. 1950s, okay? Things are starting to change a little. Now, there's multiple genres within these decades. I couldn't cover all of them. So if you're like, hey, you forgot this. I'm like, well, I only had so much time and so much space. 1960s, things are starting to get crazy. Just a little. <laughs> Just a tad. You're like, culture's starting to change a little bit. I don't know what happened, but the 1970s, things broke open. <laughs> Now, I want to know. Now, some of you guys are like, you know, maybe the earlier stuff, you're like, I didn't know anybody then. But now you're like, oh, that was me. Now, I just want to know, show of hands, we're not going to shame anybody who was wearing bell bottoms in the 70s. Let me see. Funny. All right. I hear they're coming back. So if you held on to them and you can fit into them, you know, you might be trendy again. Now, and then all of a sudden they discovered like color in the 1980s. People are like, fluorescents are in, we're doing it. We're 80s, and then, of course, we have the 90s. How many 90s babies do we have in here? Okay, all right. All right. So we, we emulate and become what we're looking at. We do this with sports figures, right? If, if, if there is a certain athlete that is pioneering maybe a new style or a new movement or whatnot, people will see it, even younger athletes, and they'll emulate it, right? Like when Iverson, I'm from Philly, so I watched Alan Iverson a lot, and he created like this crossover move and, uh, and broke Michael Jordan's ankles one time. I mean, that was like all of a sudden everybody on the playgrounds were doing Alan Iverson crossovers. Uh, to the basket or Michael Jordan sticking his tongue out while he's slam dunking, right? These are people of greatness in athletics. And all of a sudden, the sports uh, kids who are coming up start to emulate the amazing athletes. Why? Because it's what they're gazing at they start to become. We start to copy. We start to consciously and self-consciously doing this. And But on a moral and character level, we see God, we see his goodness, and we see it and we experience it, and then we become like him. The more you consume him, the more you will emulate him. I mean, the more you read this word, right? Like when you're reading about his character and his goodness, you know, you're, you're, you're consuming the word. When you're spending time in his presence, you're consuming him, and it's impossible not to change. All right. Okay. When I look at new believers and I talk and I'm, and there's so many people coming to Jesus more than ever. And it's like, and they, and, and they're, t and just recently talking to them and they're like, man, when, when I got saved, my, my father's not saved. When I got saved, like my whole life got changed and they didn't understand it a bit, but my behavior started to change. Not because we do behavior modification classes here. It's not, it's not that. It's like, how can you stare at God and not change? It's just, in, it's like instantaneous. The role of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, to 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, the Holy Spirit plays a crucial role in our moral transformation, producing characteristics in believers that reflect God's nature. This is the consequence, the result of being in his presence. It's like when you're in his presence and you're seeing his glory, your heart is like a bed, a flower bed. You're getting seeds deposited in you. Patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. That you can't do it on your own. See, some people say, I, I'm just going to change what I do. I am going to change who I am. I am going to have different behavior. No, you can't. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit, only through the grace that Jesus Christ offers us, does our behavior become, not because we're controlling it from the outside, but because we've been transformed from the inside. In Romans 12, 2, it talks about um, renewing of the mind. It says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, moral transformation, uh, spiritual trans transformation involves a renewal of the mind, a reorientation of one's thoughts and attitudes towards God's will, leading to holy living that aligns with God's and with godly plans. So when we're talking about our, our purpose and, and what we're made for, we're actually made for his glory. When you get in his glory, when you're actually surrounded by his glory, your heart becomes his heart. You know, I've talked, I've said this before, but it's like Teresa Avila. She, she talks about the seven stages of prayer. And it's just a metaphor that she kind of created where it's like when we first start praying to God and we're in his presence, we, we petition him for our wants and needs and like what we need, what we want in life. And then we get a little closer to God in his glory. And we start seeing that, man, we're kind of, I'm dirty. I'm I'm before a king and I'm dirty. And, and then you say, oh God, you know, I'm, I'm unrighteous, you know, like I, I'm unworthy to be in your presence. And then you get a little closer and then all of a sudden you're too close. So the, it's too bright. You don't even see yourself. All you see is him. And you say, you're worthy. You're holy. There is none like you. You know, there's a, 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 a lot of groups that talk about the different um, uh, ch church. It's like church groups. Uh, study groups and they are like all into what is the perfect church service like how, what's the what's the what's the best way to get the most people to attend your service to stay there and so there's like a formula that they come up with and I, I don't subscribe to these things but there's a formula and 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 one recently was saying that the most someone can be in worship and enjoy it on average is 28 minutes not 25 minutes not 30 minutes, 28 minutes. Now, is it that the average person can only stand 28 minutes or is that the bar we're setting them at? See, being in God's presence is a muscle, a practice that you have to do on your own. And I don't, I want to be a church that we could go into worship and it could be an hour and a half long and you don't care because you are used to being in his presence. Now, you don't have to wave a flag, although that's amazing. You don't have to raise your hands, although that's great. You don't have to dance. And I, some people shouldn't dance because if I were to dance, the presence of God would leave this room. OK, you'd be like, stop it, Paul. Stop it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, and so I shouldn't dance. But, but, man, his presence would really have to show up for me to dance. Okay. And, and I, but, and so, but you can also, you can also worship God in his presence, sitting, contemplating on his goodness. You don't have to do you, you be who God made you be in his presence. You know, when, Pete, when God's presence historically in the Bible, when he showed up, people were on their faces. Sometimes that's going to happen. And that's okay. Some people kneel. 
My point isn't what you're doing. My point is, who are you gazing upon? And if you can build up that muscle, man, it's so good. It's like, how close do you want to be to the fire? Do you want to be where it just is a little warm and you get a little taste and you walk away? Or can you get as close to the fire till you become the fire? It's the difference, right? How good, how close? It's on you, it's on me. We are as close to God as we want to be. And that's one of the most convicting statements I've ever said to myself. Sometimes we think, oh, if this circumstance changes, I'll be close to God. If I get this breakthrough, I'll be close to God. If I do this, I'll be close to God. No, he doesn't change. He's already here. It's us. It's us that has to change. It's us that needs to draw near. Don't get me wrong. He's after you. And he's not going to stop till he gets all of you. Go and make disciples. Did I skip one? No. Go and make disciples. Sharing God and making disciples. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. It says, Jesus said, love your name. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first commandment. This is. This is the one, look, everyone's like looking and going like, yeah, I, I, I don't want to steal. I don't want to commit murder. I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want to covet my neighbor's wife. We, we, we talk about all these other guidelines. The number one we all miss is the first one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's where I miss Because I haven't mastered where I can do that 24 hours a day yet. And then Jesus says, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Don't overlook that statement. The second is like the first, which means the second is just beneath the first. It's not like one and two. It's like one and 1.2. The second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your heart. Love is the essence of God's character. It's central to spiritual and moral transformation, guiding us in our relationships. Now, here's the thing. Some of us, don't love ourselves, okay? I don't, for various reasons. Maybe a lot of people degraded us as we were younger and we grew up with this image that we were less than who we are. Maybe it's self-degradation where we say we're just horrible. We're unworthy of love. This is where a lot of people struggle. And it's 100% a lie from the enemy. So if you don't love yourself, and even if you hate yourself, it's hard to love someone. It's hard. Because if you were to love them as yourself, you would hate them because you hate yourself, right? So, I mean, that's the logic. Here's the thing. If you skip the first commandment, you can never do the second well. Because when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, you get into his glory And you see his loving kindness towards you. You see how he loves you with an everlasting love. A love that encompasses all love. There is nothing you could do less to make him love you. There's nothing you could do more to make him love you more. He loves you with an everlasting love. It's never going to weigh. That's why Emrys had that word. He loves us because he loves us because he loves us because he loves us. And you can never do anything about it. And when you realize how much he loves you, it gives you this intrinsic worth. And you realize how much you're loved. So you can love yourself as your neighbor if you know how to love God. And understand his love for you. 
this is the kingdom. This is glory. To understand his love and to love others that way. It's like sitting with someone long enough, you get to know what is good and what is not. The more you know God, the naturally supernatural way you get to know what God loves and what God doesn't sin. Some say, did, did people teach you how to not sin? And, and yeah, we should read his word and learn what sins are. But the reality is, it will be natural for you. You don't longer want to, to steal because you love God. This is a thing that comes out. And we become like each other because we're becoming like God. Now, I'm not talking about clothing. I, I, I listened to a, a theologian recently, and I, I knew he had a sermon on the glory of God. And I said, oh, I wonder what he thinks about this. And he's from a different denomination and background. And he's a wonderful theologian in many, many regards. Uh, he talks about the glory of God. And he talks about the Mount Sinai and Moses going up and, and getting the Ten Commandments and meeting with God. And it says that uh, any animal that comes near it, you know, shoot it down. Anyone who touches the mountain, they're going to die. And he talks about this. And then he says, I can't believe people can read this and show up to church in sandals and, and swim trunks or shorts. And I'm thinking, he missed it. God doesn't care if you're wearing sandals. Jesus wore sandals. <laughs> Trust me, Jesus experienced the Father's glory. Now, of course, we want to be modest and in that sense. But the reality is, when we become like him, we're not talking about a way to dress. We're talking about a way to be. We become like those we hang around. We become like our spouses. I mean, you know, when my wife gets pregnant, I get fat. I just can't help it, Ruth. You don't get fat, but I do. She told me to say that. The role of community. This brings us to this. St. Irenaeus of Lyons, a church father from the second century. This is very old. His statement encapsulates the notion of humanity's purpose and transformation through divine grace. He says this, the glory of God is a living man. And when we say man, it means humanity, okay? It engulfs women and men. The glory of God is a living man and the life of man consists in beholding God. And people are wondering what their destiny, what their purpose, what are we supposed to do in life? And what, what am I for? What am I created for? Let me tell you this. You've been created to behold his glory and reveal his glory to others. We should be a lighthouse on wheels. He, he's the one. He's the only one. When he's in the right place, everything else falls into place. When it's out of order is when we fall short. One of my friends, I was, he told me his story um, about a year or two ago, maybe two years ago now. And I don't want to, you all probably know, know him, but I want him to share his story one day. So, but I'm going to. I'm going to share it. And I, I, I clarified some details because I got it wrong in the first service. But he was going through a drought, not really. His heart was, was, was getting further away from God. And, and God challenged him and said, spend 15 minutes a day in the morning with me for 100 days. He said he wasn't feeling God's presence anymore. He wasn't encountering God. So he said, okay, God, I'll give you 100 days because he was about to do things in his life that would have changed his life forever. But God said, please do this first. So he goes and he sits in his uh, family room or whatever by himself early in the morning for 15 minutes. He did not feel anything. 
for about 30 to 60 days. He started to get his heart, his heart started to change a little. And then by like the 70th day, he said it was like something broke. And God's presence just flooded the room. And you've experienced God's glory like never before. Now listen, you don't have to feel something to experience his glory. It's by faith we access God, okay? We're not... But according to the scripture, he does show up in manifested ways sometimes. And the result of him spending a hundred days with God for 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes changed the whole direction of his life for the better. I think sometimes half our problems are not physical. It's just, are we willing to gaze into his glory and be transformed? Apostle Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 3.18 about looking at the Lord with unveiled faces and contemplating him and his glory and being transformed. Is it this simple? That's, that's what I think is the hardest thing for us to grasp. It can't be that simple, God. We need to do something. God's saying, no, you need to be something. Be still and know that I am God. Spend time in my glory and be transformed. Watch everything else melt away. That song which says, we gaze into his glory and all other things become dimly, strangely dim in the light of his glory. Something like that. Anyway, guys, it's the hardest, it's, this is where your faith needs to come in, is that you have to believe that it's possible. So you have to do it. If you tell me you know it's possible, but you're not doing it, then I know you really don't believe it. Does that make sense? Because Albuquerque needs his glory. Our neighbors need his glory. And they're not going to come into this building most likely. But you have the opportunity to spend time with the one who made the cosmos an experience of a personal God and share that with everyone around you. The glory of God is a living man and the life of the man consists in beholding God. Andy sent me this. He said, Irenaeus also said, the glory of God is a man fully alive. One of the most offensive things I get, the, the most religious spirit that gets stirred up when we talk about sharing the love and the glory of God with people outside the church, I talk to that and this mission on this house to other pastors and uh, other, other pastors in our staff do as well, Andy and Josh, and, and we, we share about the glory of God. And we share about telling people about Jesus and make disciples and and, and, they, and they get offended. It's amazing. I'm not even telling them like you're doing something wrong. I'm just saying what God's doing here. And they go, well, that's for you guys, but we're, we're just called the disciple. And I said, you can't have evangelism without discipleship. And you can't have discipleship without evangelism. They go hand in hand. Sharing the glory of God with others is all about his presence through your lives, leaving this building and going out into the world. Why don't you stand? I want to pray for us right now. Yeah, let's give Jesus. Come on. I want to pray for us right now. Jesus, would you, would you reveal your glory to us? 
Holy Spirit, would you just move through this room, move through our lives? Lord, would you, first of all, convict us, including myself, of anything that my eyes are focused on that's not you that I'm being transformed by? Just show me, God. I, I need to hear it. I need to see it. Lord, I repent of that. And God, I pray that we would be a people that would value your presence, your glory, and that we would allow it to transform our life, that we wouldn't just be around the light, but we would be in the light. Just like that fire in scripture is often referred to as a refiner's fire, it always burns up what is, what is, what is not of you. Lord, would you burn up everything that's not of you that's getting in the way? And Jesus, I pray that we would be lighthouses on wheels outside this building. That we would be known as a city set on fire for Jesus Christ. And that this church would be a part of the great harvest that would help bring people to you and share the good news of your love, your compassion, and your value. And how much you value them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, I also want to just invite our ministry team up here right now. Uh, if you are needing breakthrough in healing, in finances, in um, any relational things, anything that you just, maybe it's something other than you're just like, I just want more of God's glory, and you want someone to pray with you, we want to pray with you, any circumstance, because we believe that prayer is powerful and that prayer works.